the photographer's eye sees things the rest of us might not. Today's guest uses the camera to tell stories about cultural identity and intergenerational trauma. She's Haruka Sakaguchi this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with Salve's Pell Center. Our guest this week is Haruka Sakaguchi, a documentary photographer born in Japan, but now coming to us today from New Jersey. Haruka, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, uh, we want to talk to you about your work, but we thought it would be interesting to know a little bit, too, about your background. I mentioned you were born in Japan. You moved to the United States as an infant. What was it like growing up as an immigrant in the United States? So, yeah, growing up as an immigrant in the United States, uh, both of my parents, um, including myself, were first-generation Japanese. Uh, so I think for the most part of my life, I've uh, always kind of, I had to negotiate multiple cultural identities and uh, multiple languages. And I think that um, had kind of culminated into my interest in uh, cultural identity and also um, how these cultural identities are interpreted across different uh, generations, uh, which is what informs a lot of the work uh, that I do today. And we're going to get to that work in particular, uh, but, but why then uh, documentary photography uh, as the medium to explore those issues? Yeah, so um, hmm, straight out of high school, I had an interest in uh, social work, actually. So I had these aspirations to become a, a social worker. I was volunteering uh, at this organization that uh, conducted these independent assessments for uh, parents with histories of mental health and uh, substance abuse issues uh, who are working with local authorities to regain custody of their children. Um, and I spent a lot of time working with mothers mostly who were in recovery and uh, they uh, were kind of reuniting uh, with their uh, children for the first time in years for some. And I was assisting them with these kind of day-to-day -day tasks uh, like cooking, and uh, buying groceries for their children, but also these bonding activities like reading and playing with their children. Um, but as fulfilling as it was, uh, it was really emotionally uh, taxing. <laughs> and I uh, quickly learned that I didn't really have the mental resilience it took to uh, work in this field and social work. Um, so then I decided to go back to school actually and uh, to study journalism. Um, I wrote for my college newspaper i had these aspirations to become a, a reporter but i um through the you know the re reporting that i did for this uh, newspaper i quickly learned that i was uh, too shy and kind of deferential to become an investigative <laughs> reporter <laughs> um and then uh, but while i was kind of plugging through these stories I, I made my first portrait of a student on campus that i was profiling and i felt this this kind of instant alignment um, and even though it took me several more years to kind of pursue this professionally, I, I think uh, through my interest in social work and journalism, I was I was always interested in kind of engaging with the public somehow. But I, uh, it took me a while to kind of find the right um, medium uh, and the right language to do it um, in a meaningful way. So photography just happened to be the right vehicle. Um, for my interest in engaging and uh, possibly and hopefully serving the public in some way. So your work falls into several general themes and we're going to get into two of them. Cultural identity is a, is a big theme of your work and typecastproject.com has much of that imagery there. Tell us about typecastproject.com, and then we'll get into some of the photographs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, typecast is uh, this satirical portrait series uh, that I've been, uh, that I was working on with my colleague uh, Griselda San Martin, uh, who is a fellow photojournalist. Um, it's a portrait series that depicts cultural typecasting practices 
in the film and entertainment industry uh, that I worked on from 2018 to 2019. So what my colleague Griselda and I did, we made these staged portraits uh, where we asked uh, ethnic minority uh, actors in New York and LA uh, to kind of embody the stereotypical, the culturally stereotypical roles that they often get typecast in, that they get a lot of these audition calls for. Um, and we made these kind of stage portraits of them. And then we also asked them to embody uh, the roles that they uh, wish to be cast in, their ideal roles, their wish roles, and um, asked them to, again, embody these roles and made stage portraits of them as well. So it's presented as a diptych where you have a typecast role and an ideal role. So there certainly is a satirical element, but there's also truth. In, in these photographs as well. And as I said, we'll get into them in, in a second. I have another question. How did you find these actors? I mean, you found a whole lot of them and, and they're really good. Mm -hmm. So initially, because Griselda and I are both uh, based in New York City, uh, we uh, were going through personal networks and we were trying to connect with um, uh, people of color actors that way. Uh, but actually, our first photo shoot uh, was with an actor that we connected with over Craigslist. <laughs> we kind of wanted to cast a wide net to make sure that you know, we weren't just kind of going through people that we knew. Um, we both have uh, kind of uh, nominal uh, connections in the film industry, but uh, we were just kind of curious about connecting with uh, people that we may not have had a lot of uh, intersection with. So. Um, the, the first portrait that we made was actually uh, with Dan Chen, who is a Taiwanese-American actor who, again, we, we just connected with over Craigslist. And uh, we showed up at his house in Montclair, New Jersey, the next week and um, made some portraits of him. Yeah. Hey, Haruka, the, one of the things that strikes me about this project is that you are really telling a story uh, uh, as much as you are documenting anything. And, and Wayne mentioned the satirical element in this. How do you come up with an idea like that? Where does that spark of creativity and uh, creation uh, come from? Yeah, um, so Griselda and I both come from journalistic backgrounds. Griselda is an incredible photojournalist who's been working um, on issues of uh, family separation at the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, I had been working on a project with atomic bomb survivors in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at that time. So uh, we both, um, we connected over a glass of wine one night and we were both talking about how, you know, like we were wondering how sustainable this work was. You know, it can be uh, quite um, uh, uh, quite taxing to be working on um, topics like this for a long time. And um yeah, Grisalda was talking, uh, just kind of casually talking about a film festival that she had attended uh, and she had connected with a Mexican-American actress there who was talking about, you know, all the ridiculously culturally stereotypical roles that she had to audition for um, to kind of get to the place that she is today. And uh, we were both talking about this and wondering, you know, what if there is a way for us to both step out of our kind of journalistic mediums and kind of come up with a more conceptual um, approach of, uh, but, but still something that engages with this issue in a meaningful way. And um, it's interesting, this typecast project also went through its own evolution as well. So I think because both of us had this journalistic background, we were initially interested in just photographing the actors embodying their stereotypical roles, but we had asked them to um, kind of showcase all the all the uh, wardrobe pieces and the props that they had accumulated over the years uh, during uh, throughout their acting career to show up at these taping auditions. And some actors, you know, really do like to um, come in costume and use props to uh, really kind of enhance their performance, right? So um, we had asked them to keep these objects and uh, we were making environmental portraits, so a little uh, wider portraits of them embodying their roles in their own homes <laughs> surrounded by the props that they had accumulated. And we were hoping that this could um, communicate, you know, kind of multiple layers to the story. It's not just about the roles that they're typecast in, but also the props that they had accumulated and also kind of their living situations um, to uh, portray that, you know, these aren't roles that uh, 
they're just you know taking uh, because they want to. It's 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 a part of how they make a living. Um, but then, uh, as the process and as the story evolved, um, and as we continued to work uh, with actors, uh, we decided that instead of spending the energy kind of making these environmental kind of like uh, this like prescriptive kind of informative portraits, uh, we wanted to focus more on the wish roles and um, kind of giving more. Uh, uh, time and space for uh, the audience to look at the stereotypical roles and the ideal roles and kind of experience the gap between those two images. So let's get into Dan Chen. You mentioned Dan Chen. Tell us about Dan and, and what we're seeing now. Yep. Yeah. So Dan is, like I said, he was the uh, first actor that had sat for a portrait, portrait um, with us for this project. Uh, he's a Taiwanese American actor and his uh, his stereotypical role is doctor and his ideal role is Captain America. <laughs> um, so like I said, uh, our initial idea was to just photograph the portraits of the actors and their stereotypical roles only, um, but when we went over to Dan's house in in New Jersey, uh, you know, we we had this kind of suitcase full of gear. We were really determined to make the stereotypical uh, portrait of him, and um, this was also back when we still had the idea of having the props kind of laid out in front of him. So we had asked Dan to prepare a bunch of scrubs, a few stethoscopes, and um, kind of even this fake ID that he used to bring to uh, casting auditions um, to really embody his stereotypical role as a doctor. Uh, but while we were uh, photographing with Dan in his living room, uh, we saw a, a kind of display showcase with a, a military uniform on it in the corner of his room and uh, we had asked you know what what is a military uniform doing in the corner of your room and he had shared uh, that he uh, was uh, it was his uniform from when he was in the military in the u.s military um and dan kind of remarked he said you know it would be cool to play a sergeant uh, one day or like even something like captain america one day <laughs> um so that was when we were we were floored by the statement, you know, and that happened right around the time when Griselda and I were both like putting on this really cheap lab coat on Dan and asking him to again pose for this doctor role. And we were like, you know, this just doesn't feel right anymore. <laughs> um, so we immediately kind of um, uh, took out our reporting pads and we started asking him, interviewing Dan about his background in the military and about uh, the ideal roles that he would like to embody. And Captain America was one of them. So um, we had booked a follow-up shoot with him to uh, photograph him in his ideal role as Captain America. Mm. So, so tell us about Lolia Tomi, who identifies as Nigerian. Yeah, so uh, Lolia is a Nigerian actress who we met in Los Angeles. Uh, we ended up in Los Angeles because uh, we had uh, partnered with uh, Photoville, uh, who had kindly offered us an exhibition space in the inaugural Photoville LA uh, Festival. And not only did they offer us an exhib exhibition space, but they also offered us a tent uh, for us to be able to uh, recruit and photograph actors, ethnic minority actors in the LA area. So they had kindly um, helped us publish a, a recruitment post in um, a local publication. And um, there were about 15 actors who had showed up uh, to this tent, uh, this you know, very small tent with a makeshift uh, photo studio setup. And uh, yeah, um, Lolia was one of the first actors that we had uh, photographed in LA due to um, Photoville's generosity. And uh, this kind of put us on the map for uh, connecting with other actors in Los Angeles uh, to again, embody their stereotypical and ideal roles for us. And, and what were her stereotypical and ideal roles? Yeah, so uh, Lolia's typecast role is in Sex Worker, and her ideal role is Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. Hey, so you mentioned the work that you were doing uh, documenting the intergenerational trauma of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, that's the 1945 project. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? 
Yeah, so the 1945 project is a uh, portrait series of atomic bomb survivors, or kibaksha in Japanese, uh, who uh, were um, inflicted by the bomb, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, it was a project that I worked on from 2016 to 2017. Um, and I had the opportunity to interview and photograph over uh, 50 Hibakusha and their descendants. Hey, you mentioned the, the emotional toll that, that that kind of work takes. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? What, how does that affect you uh, uh, in, in, in photographing and meeting these people and hearing their stories? Yeah, um, I will always remember the first interview that I was um, willing to have with an atomic bomb survivor. His name is Yoshiro Yamawaki, who he was uh, telling me this uh, very you know, descriptive firsthand account of uh, losing his father to the atomic bomb and um, having to cremate his father uh, along with his brothers uh, at a very t tender age. He was um, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and none of his brothers were older than 16 at this time. And as uh, he was relaying the story, I could just tell it wasn't just the content of this, you know, the, the, what, the account that he was telling me about, but just the precision and um, the uh, how I could just tell that he had really had to revisit this memory over and over again to articulate it in the way that he was presenting it to me. And I just, I couldn't help but think about the how, how painful it must be to revisit that so many times um, for me to have this privilege to be able to hear the story that I just started breaking down and crying. And it, um, uh, it was a kind of a worst case scenario for me here. I'm trying to put up this kind of professional demeanor and uh, in, at as a result, I, I had, you know, a, a Hibakusha who was comforting me at the end of the interview, and I was like, oh, this is, this is not going well at all. Mm. Um, but, yeah, uh, that, that was how my first interview went. And after, you know, speaking with, again, the uh, Hibakusha and their descendants over the year, I uh, started to realize that it was, um, I, I think, as, a journalist, I uh, wanted to make sure that I took time in between these interviews, not uh, to prevent myself from breaking down and crying again, but to um, give myself uh, a space to uh, prepare for the next interview so that I'm not uh, approaching it with a, a my own kind of defense mechanisms or feeling like I have to uh, put up a wall to kind of maintain this professional uh, demeanor that I can uh, kind of approach these interviews uh, with with a with a much softer approach, but also while um, being able to conduct the interviews in a professional way. <laughs> so another person you photographed as part of the 1945 project was Shizuku Miramura. Tell us about her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Ms. Shizuko Mitamura was, uh, she was only three years old uh, when, uh, at the time of the bombing, and she only began to share her story as a hibakusha uh, after the death of her daughter, uh, Miwa, who was only 39 years old uh, when she died of cancer. Um, and that coincidentally was around the same time that Ms. Mitamura herself was diagnosed uh, with colon cancer. Um, but by the time Miwa, her daughter, had shared with her about her cancer diagnosis, it was it was too late, and she had uh, passed away a few months later. Um, and what I felt compelling about Mita, Ms. Mitamura's story is that, you know, like I shared with you, she had, was diagnosed with colon cancer once she was 39. Uh, she was diagnosed with uh, cancer again um, at age 59. Uh, Ms. Mitamura's second oldest sister, uh, was uh, diagnosed with colon cancer twice. Uh, her third oldest sister was diagnosed uh, with rectal cancer and passed away at mm -hmm. age 39. Um, so these are all members of her household who were exposed to the atomic bomb. So I think there's a lot of focus on uh, the individuals that died from the initial blast. Um, but Ms. Mitamura's story really um, illustrates the aftermath of uh, the, the bomb many, many years, up to decades after the bombing. 
Um, and uh, it also kind of encapsulates the intergenerational nature of the uh, impact of the bomb because uh, Ms. Mitamura's sister's daughters have also uh, passed away in their 30s to 40s due to uh, cancer and um, uh, one of them with brain tumor. Um, but yeah, Ms. Mitamura's story is especially compelling because uh, she kind of suspects that her daughter had refused to share with her about her cancer diagnosis. Um, because she knew deep down inside that it was because of uh, because she was a descendant of Ms. Mitamura of Ahibaksha. And um, she wanted to kind of relieve her mother from the guilt that she thought um, her mother would in inevitably feel um, after she hears about her uh, cancer diagnosis. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Mitamura is one of many uh, Ahibaksha who uh, had dealt with. Um, not only their own kind of physical ailments, but also uh, physical ailments of their children and their grandchildren as well. And having to kind of negotiate that uh, as uh, the years went by after the bombing. So in sharing these stories, was, was there any healing element to the people you photographed? Uh, I don't know if they sh were sharing them for the first time ever or or had shared before, but was there any therapeutic value to them, do you think? Did, did you get that sense? Did they tell you that? I certainly hope so. I think there is a catharsis in, uh, um, you know, sharing your story for the first time, like I shared with Ms. Mitamura. You know, she uh, did not speak about her experience until uh, the death of her daughter. And there were actually many Hibaksha who did not share uh, their stories until uh, they were either retired um, or their uh, children were gainfully employed or married uh, for fear that, you know, coming out with their stories of uh, being a Hibaksha would uh, then identify uh, them and their families as uh, Hibaksha or their descendants. And it could lead to uh, discrimination. You know, they were afraid that if they came out with their stories as a Hibaksha, then their children, maybe their son, uh, wouldn't be able to uh, get um, uh, hired uh, by a firm because there were fears that, you know, he may have, uh, as a second generation Hibaksha, that he may have um, uh, issues with um, or medical conditions as well. Or if your uh, daughter is identified as a descendant of Hibaksha, then it may be difficult to find a marriage partner um, because of uh, these beliefs that there are. Um, genetic traits that can be passed down through radiation sickness. Um, so I think I'm not sure if uh, retelling these stories uh, or, you know, my, my particular interview or my um, being able to photograph them had led to a catharsis on their end. But I think they really, um, everyone who came out with their stories went through their own journeys and their own evolution um, to uh, come to this point where they were uh, finally comfortable enough to share their stories with the rest of the world. Arka, we've got about uh, two and a half minutes left. I, I wanted to ask you, though, about uh, a, a work that's very much in progress, and it's called Campu, An American Story. What is that project? Yeah, so Campu uh, is a project that I'm uh, currently working on. It's uh, an educational website about the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, during World War II. Um, uh, I have been attending uh, pilgrimages, annual pilgrimages that I actually did not know about until I started research for this project uh, that former incarcerees of the 10 WRA concentration camps um, across the U.S. Uh, have been revisiting the sites where they or their family were incarcerated um, in the form of pilgrimages. And they have been um, kind of conducting these uh, community, uh, uh, these activities where they come together as a community and they uh, honor, either are there to honor their ancestors or, or um, kind of reflect on their own experiences of being incarcerated in these camps. And uh, similar to my 1945 project, uh, Kampu, which is Japanese for camp, um, it documents uh, both survivors and their descendants uh, of this event. And uh, much like 1945, many survivors of these American concentration camps, they don't share uh, their experiences um, uh, 
uh, with their descendants for fear of kind of further stigmatizing them um, and kind of reminding them of uh, the discrimination that their ancestors had faced and uh, potentially kind of instilling this uh, thought that they're outsiders um, in the United States. Um, so yeah, uh, my, my goal for this project is uh, similar to 1945 to kind of acknowledge the intergenerational nature of uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans. Um, and uh, similar and also in format to 1945, I've been asking the survivors and descendants to write a letter. Uh, for the 1945 projects, it was a broader topic. I've been asking them to write a letter just addressing future generations. Um, but for Kampu in particular, I've been asking survivors to write a letter to their younger self when they were incarcerated and um, to descendants to write a letter to a survivor in their family. That's a powerful and important project. Haruka Sakaguchi, that's all the time we have this week. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, uh, that is all the time, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on social media or visit pellcenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>